Well, good morning. Good to see each one of you here uh, and trusting the Lord to help us today. And hopefully you can sing as they were playing this morning, Oh, How I Love Jesus. The sweetest, the sweetest name on earth. He's worthy to be praised this morning, and we're here to do just that. We pray that God would just come and meet with us and speak to our hearts together. And uh, many people, it's spring break, and if you look around, many people have made their journeys to some far, far away land, and they're enjoying family time together. We're here enjoying our spiritual family together, and uh, hopefully blood family as well. I see a root row of phase, and hopefully that's a... Y'all getting along today? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Good to be with family. Good to be with God's people. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for who you are. Lord, we're here this morning to lift up your name, and we're just asking that as you would meet with us and speak to our hearts, dear Lord, through the songs, through the message, whatever it may be, Lord, may you be lifted and glorified, and as you would help us, we'll thank you and praise you for it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing as Glenn comes to lead us in our singing. Good morning. Let's start out with a chorus um, of Great is Thy Faithfulness. We're going to sing that chorus. Let's worship him this morning. <clears throat>
stand as we turn back to 225. 225. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's love? Amen. Let's sing it out this morning and worship to him.
Amen. Praise his name. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins. And in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, but God, who is rich in mercy and love for his great love wherewith he loved us. And even when we were dead, bound by the shackles of sin, he quickened us and made us alive to him. Praise his name. We have so much to rejoice over today. Glad that the bonds of sin and death have been broken. Our hearts have been set free to walk with him. And now, bold, we pro approach the eternal throne. We can come boldly. We can, we can come with confidence today as we pray because the price for our sins has been paid and he's interceding for us right now. Praise his name. So as we go to prayer, we do need to give thanks to God for the unspeakable gift that we have and the freedom that we have in him. As we pray, we're not only giving thanks, but we're bringing our petitions to the Lord. We have so many, and we're, God does not tire of us coming. We need to remember these, and there are a number of them that are listed here in front of you. We're especially remember, remembering um, John Chamber, still in ICU in, in Stewart. Uh, let's continue to pray for him and the family. Um, remembering Kevin Spriggs and Aaron Hamilton with an upcoming surgery and Butch Heath with upcoming surgery. Janelle Keaton is, is very, very low and needs our prayers and the family needs our prayers along with Cheryl and Marshall and Brother Bill and that family there in, in Cincinnati. Um, let's remember them. And we've had, uh, we've had our share of just people who have had some tumbles and falls. So let's let's remember uh, Brother Allie who had a fall and Sister Judy Bolson and and then uh, Pastor Pierpoint has a, a neighbor that comes over regularly to help with their care, um, with the Pierpoint's care. Her name is Pat. And um, Pat had a fall yesterday and broke her hip uh, while she was at, at the Pierpoint's place and is in the hospital. She might be in surgery right now, but this morning sometime has hip surgery. Let's remember Pat, she, she thinks a lot of the peer points and in our church family. So um, um, let's do pray for her. Um, of course, Sister Bonnie Cleaver has passed away and she has some extended family. Let's remember that. And remembering a, a legacy that she has left. Praise the Lord for that. And then uh, let's do remember the other needs. There are those who are ministering. Um, Pastor McElwain in Alaska, Alan Barr is ministering. The College Choir is ministering in, in, um, in Indiana today, and they've had their share of sickness on that um, 55 um, passenger coach. And, and so let's, let's do remember them as they, as they minister today also. And for the convention that begins in Gatlinburg on Tuesday, let's pray that God would come in a very special way and, and there in that convention. Amen. God bless you. Please stand. Pastor Matt is coming to lead us in prayer. Amen. As we've been reminded, so many needs, but we serve one big God. Amen. Would you join with us in prayer at this time? Dear Heavenly Father, again, we just continue in your presence, Lord, thanking you and praising you for your faithfulness, one that is rich in mercy and, and love and faithfulness and grace to us, dear Lord, that, that while we were yet sinners, you died for us, that we could have uh, forgiveness of our sins and, and have the hope of heaven and a relationship with you. And, 
And dear Lord, we just, we just realize today that we would not be able to stand here with joy in our heart and peace deep within our soul if it were not for your love and patience and kindness with us. Dear Lord, we're thankful that when we were rebellious in our heart, you didn't just push us aside and forget about us, but you continued to chase after us and, and come after us. And in your faithfulness, it's just who you are. In your faithfulness, you, the songwriter said, you stood at our, our heart's door mid sunshine and rain, patiently waiting an entrance to gain. And we're so glad that you did. And so today, because of your faithfulness, dear Lord, we confessed our sins to you. And today we find the joy and happiness of sins forgiven, released from the bondage of sin, and Lord, the guilt and shame of it. Lord, we just have so much to praise you for. And our prayer is this morning that if there would be anyone here this morning that in this place or listening online that does not know you as a personal Savior, does not know that joy and happiness, that Lord, there would be a time in the very near future that they would come to know you and they would find you to be Lord and Savior of their life. Your Lord, there are family members connected to every single one of us, dear Lord, who, who maybe never, hardly ever even go to church, but, but yet they're just living their life for self and, and filled with sin. But Lord, again, you who are faithful to us can be faithful to them, and we pray that you would find them where they are, and you would just gently and lovingly call their name and help them to see their need of a Savior. And dear Lord, in their wanderings, would you find them? In their lostness, dear Lord, would you bring light? And Lord, we just pray for lost loved ones and lost humanity in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our workplaces. Lord, would you help us to shine brightly for you that, that we might point other people to you, dear God. We just pray for the spiritual needs above and beyond everything else. And dear Lord, we recognize there are many, many, many physical needs. Just a handful mentioned today. All of those that are battling cancer and, and ongoing sickness and surgeries. And dear Lord, uh, even Pat, who could be in surgery today, this moment. Lord, we ask that you would help in those situations. We bring them to you. You are the great physician, able to heal, able to touch, able to do the miraculous. And so, Lord, our faith still holds in that today, that you can do anything you desire. But, Lord, if you choose to allow the affliction to continue, we still are convinced that you will be with us. You will be with them, even in the valley of the shadow of death. God, you are near. So we pray to one who's alive and well, all-knowing and aware of all things. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would help. We commit these needs to you, Lord, spiritually, physically, in every way. And God, as you would move and help, Lord, we, we just, we just sur submit to your will in these things. And God, will thank you and praise you for what you continually do. Be in this offering, in the offertory. Dear Lord, may, it, uh, may, may you receive glory through the ministry of the song and through our worship and giving. And as you would help us, we'll continue to thank you and praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Lord bless you as you give.
Thank you for that offertory this morning. If you didn't recognize that song or didn't know the lyrics to it, it talks about Jesus Christ and the fact that he is above all powers, all kings, all kingdoms, everything in this world. But the chorus says that he was crucified. He was laid behind the stone. You lived to die rejected and alone like a rose trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me. The title of that song is Above All. I'm thankful that we serve a Jesus Christ, the Lord, that cared enough about us, even though he was above everything, he was willing to come down to where we are, even as we celebrated his death and resurrection last week. I trust that we are continuing to live in light of that this morning. Amen. Thank the Lord. I want to share with you a few announcements this morning. Uh, keep in mind, we are continuing to have our time of prayer before the evening services at 545 p.m. in room 105. Uh, looking forward to the youth emphasis service tonight for the young people. Keep in mind that we'll sit up front and then also have choir practice at 6 o'clock, uh, preparing for the choir to sing this evening. Um, Pastor Pierpoint's birthday celebration is on April 9th at 6.30, from 6.30 to 8.30 in the Addison Student Center. You can drop in during those times. I would love to see you there. Uh, men's breakfast this Saturday is at 8.30 in the Addison Student Center as well. It's good to see some visitors here this morning. I believe Sadie Graham is here. It's good to see you. Um, uh, as was mentioned, the Fays have some visitors and family here. I believe uh, Daniel and Marcel. Uh, I think Mary and Tish, first-time visitors, if I got your name correct. Um, Stephanie and Christelle Gold, it's good to see you back um, here as well. And then some others that came in, slipped in. It's good to have you here. We're going to have our time of fellowship, so I invite you to stand, and let's make sure everybody feels welcome this morning. It's good to be part of the family of God today. for that. Karen Carroll is going to come and sing our special this morning. Let's worship with her as they sing. I know you're 
going through the fire. It's getting hard to stand the heat, but even harder is the one dream. Is God's hand still on me? But it's lonely in the flames when you're counting days of pain. But the potter knows the clay and how much pressure it can take. How many times around the Submission to His will. He's planned a beautiful design, but it'll take some fire and time. It's gonna be okay. Cause the potter. just came through that fire not too very long ago and looking back I can see now and that my God was in control But on the hottest days I'd cry, oh Lord, isn't it about time? Cause the potter knows the clay and how much pressure it can take, how many times around the Till their submission to His will, He's planned a beautiful design, but it'll take some fire and time. It's gonna be The potter knows the claim. He's planned a beautiful design, but it'll take some fire and time. It's gonna be okay. Cause the potter Yes, it's going to be okay, because the potter knows the clay. Aren't you thankful that the potter knows the clay? And he knows how much we can take. He knows all about those things. <clears throat> but I like the part of that verse or that chorus that says that he has a design. He has a purpose. And uh, he knows what he's doing, and we can trust him. And uh, I'm thankful for that this morning. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn with us to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. I've preached from this passage before, and, uh, but yet to the, the last few days I've just felt uh, a specific thought on my mind, and uh, it's, it's different than the last time I have preached from this passage. Last time I spent more time in the clay, 
aspect of things. And this morning, I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, yesterday, when I was over here going over this one more time, and I was preaching it to this great group of empty pews, and I kept saying, Clay, 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 I thought, man, Clay's going to get tired of this this morning. <laughs> and uh, Clay is getting married next Saturday. And uh, if, if you see him, uh, please, uh, please put on your black, mournful apparel as he prepares to lay down his life <laughs> next Saturday. But uh, praying for you, Clay, and uh, trust things go well for you next Saturday. I hope it's a beautiful, beautiful day, and everything just goes as you hope that it would. That means a lot when you're thinking about weddings, doesn't it? <laughs> How things can go haywire in a heartbeat. But the potter and the clay is where we're looking this morning. Jeremiah chapter 18, start reading in verse 1. And the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. I want you to get there before I, I'm going to teach you a story. I'm going to teach you some things, but I'm not going to tell you now. Wait till you get there. I want, you'll hear from me then. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hands. And he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good for the potter to do. Now, we could just read that and meditate on that for quite some time. That's a powerful, powerful thought. The clay was spoiled in the potter's hands, but he reworked it into another vessel that seemed good for the potter to do. Wow. Aren't you thankful for the mercy and the faithfulness and the goodness of God? Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, this is what the Lord was wanting Jeremiah to see, can I not do with you as this potter has done? Declares the Lord, behold, like the clay of the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Israel was God's chosen people. And uh, it's, it's all through the prophecies and the Messiah was going to be, be born through the lineage there and everything was going to be just at a certain rate. But it says the sad story in the Gospels that when Jesus Christ came into this world to his own, his own received him not. And, and how often in the Old Testament do we see Israel, God's chosen people, God's nation just doing so well and then all of a sudden, man, just broken and terrible, terrible places they find themselves in, in bondage and overtaken and, and enslaved by, by their captors. It's a terrible story of up and down, but through all of that, the beauty is that God is faithful and God is good. And while the clay was spoiled in his hand, he was able to take those broken pieces and make something new from it. And what a beautiful, beautiful story that that is. Several passages throughout the Bible reference the potter and the clay. Studying these passages, it's really fascinating, and they reveal some powerful truths when you read them all together. And this morning, I want just to look at three elements of this story. It's going to shock you, but here they are. I want us to consider the potter for a little bit. Because I think there's some important things there. I want us to, I want us to, uh, I know with the laws that are being voted on today, this could have a different connotation, but we're going to consider the pot. Hmm. Clay, all right? We're going we're to consider the potter, the pot, and the process. Let's look at the potter very quickly this morning. In every passage that this concept is presented, the potter is always representing our sovereign God. When Jeremiah goes to the potter's house, he sees a potter sitting at his will. This potter has complete authority, complete authority over the clump of clay that's resting on his will. If the potter tightens his grip, the clay succumbs to its pressure. If the potter nudges the spinning clay upwards, guess what? It begins to rise. If he pulls at the clay, it widens. If he begins to apply downward pressure, the clay begins to shrink. Everything that clay does is under the authority of the potter's hands. 
The potter has absolute authority over the clay. And I think this is a truth that we need to be reminded of this morning as we consider this passage. Today, we, we enjoy many different types of containers. We have plastic milk jugs, water jugs, glass jars, containers of all sorts, shapes and sizes. We have canvas and plastic bags, wooden and cardboard boxes, both large and small, all sorts of containers. But in biblical times, especially in the Old Testament, they had one kind of container that served many purposes. They were nothing more than clay jars. If you had variety of needs, you made or you purchased a different sized clay jar or pot. Everything was clay. Whether it was decorative, whether it was common, they were all made out of the same stuff, dirt and water clay. It's what it was made out of. I can pause here just for a moment because we don't want to get waylaid too much, but we need to be reminded, ladies and gentlemen, this morning that every single one of us were made out of the same stuff. Whether you're rich or poor, whether you're in a place of importance or you're just in a blue-collar common position, none of those are better than the other. We're all just made out of the same stuff. It's a good thing to be reminded of this morning. If God chooses to use one in a decorative sense or a, a higher position or one in, a, in a, just an everyday use sort of thing, may I be reminded that every piece of pottery that is made is for a purpose and it's to be used in some fa- uh, form or fashion for good and good purpose and we should never for a moment feel that we are insignificant because the way God made us or the gifts that he has given us Ladies and gentlemen, we're made out of the same stuff by the same hand, and God has a purpose for every single one of us. These clay jars and pots were made under the desire and the design of the potter himself. It's been this way from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. God, the divine potter, says, formed man out of the dust of the ground. He molded us out of clay. We're, we're literally walking pottery this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay, earthen vessels, to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. Friends, we're just broken. We're just broken pieces of clay that he's put together. And inside of us as a Christian, we have the beauty of his spirit living inside of us. Friends, he is the one that receives the glory. We're nothing more than just earthen vessels of clay. Understanding that God is the potter and the authority that he has over us will help us to recognize that we really have absolutely no say about what God wants us to be. He is the potter. Romans chapter 9 verse 20 and 21 says, Nay, but old man, who art thou? that thou would reply against God, saying the thing, shall the thing formed say to him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Has not the potter power over the clay and the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another to dishonor? Ladies and gentlemen, who are we as clay to say to the potter, why in the world would you create me this way? He's the potter, we're nothing more than the clay. We live in a world that allows much talking back, as my parents used to call it. We were never allowed to do that. But today, we're we're told in a society, we're told that we're supposed to challenge everything. The slogan for Hyundai Tuscan, uh, it was was simply this. Just just a a year or so ago, this slogan was everywhere when they were trying to sell these, these vehicles. Question everything. We did. We were never allowed to do that. It was disrespectful. And if we ever tried it, and my sister and I did a time or two, we were quickly put in our place, disciplined. We received some sort of discipline that reminded us that was not something that was thought well of in our home. We were allowed to ask questions all day long. All right? We could ask questions all day long, but we were never allowed to take up the attitude and disposition of questioning them. There is a difference. 
My dad or mom, if they said, be quiet, guess what? We were to be quiet. We weren't to finish our sentence. We're not to finish our argument. We're not trying to say, but here, Dad, is what I'm trying to say. If they said, be quiet, we were taught that at that moment, we were to be quiet. If we later wanted to say, you know, what was, what was the necessity of being quiet, right? We could, we could ask a question all day long, but we could never question their authority, if that makes sense. It was disrespectful. And can I just pause for a moment to say, parents, if this is allowed in your home, if you pride yourself in letting your children question everything and have that kind of disposition, let me tell you something. You're setting your children up for massive failure in every way, especially in the spiritual realm. Are we still here? All right. I've known a few in my ministry. I, I, I Trust me, I, I'm just 46 years of age. I don't have all of the wisdom that some of the elder saints have. I know that. But I have watched parents who kind of pride themselves that, you know, I've taught my children to question everything. And today, today they don't even really want to be near church, let alone Christ, because they've just questioned everything. There's wonderful things about asking questions and receiving biblical answers. Nothing wrong with it. We need it. It's part of discipleship. It's part about learning and growing. But friends, we need to understand there comes a point in our life where we have to have the attitude that we're willing to submit to the hand of the potter in our life. The potter has one purpose and one passion. And it's found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 21. And it is simply this, God, and this is, we need to understand this, he's not here to be a hard taskmaster, God is not in our life just to, to put the brakes on anything and everything. The potter, God himself, has one passion and one desire, and it is that we would be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. The potter, friends, if we don't have a correct picture of who the potter is, everything else gets blown out of proportion. Everything else is skewed and, and weird and, and repulsive. But when we understand that God, our creator, has one desire, and that is that he wants Matt Ellison to be a vessel that's sanctified and set apart for him to be able to use to bring him honor and to bring him glory, it's then able, I'm able then to maybe comprehend a little better of why he might be squeezing in this area or pushing out in this area or working in my life it's not because he's ignorant and he's a, just a hard taskmaster he wants me to be a vessel that he can use this gives us I believe a biblical basis for thinking of the events or and the influences of our lives as his hands and his fingers shaping us just as a potter shapes clay if we fail to remember the potter's passion and desire for us, his clay, then we will always question everything that comes into our lives. And friends, we will forever be miserable for it. As a Western world Christian, we have become incredibly soft in our service to Jesus. You don't have to agree, but I, I'm convinced, I, I believe I'm on the right track, that in our physical, earthly lives, as we have seen an increase in luxuries, our spiritual lives have seen a decrease in commitment and passion and surrender to the will and the hand of the potter in our lives. Does that make sense? We've become so accustomed to all the luxuries that any time, any time some sort of pressure comes into our life, we just begin to throw up our hands and we wail and we weep and gnash our teeth. Oh, why me? This truth is evidence in our responses to the setbacks and the reverses and tragedies that we face in our life. 
to the person who fully is committed and surrendered and understanding of the potter's hand and, and his involvement in our life, their response is fashioned after Jesus' response as he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane shortly, uh, Gethsemane shortly before his crucifixion while Jesus may show some signs of reluctance and, and he's, not, he's not looking forward to what's getting ready to happen. He was not unwilling to go down the path in which he was called to walk as much as he was just, Lord, if there's any way that this pain and rejection and, and suffering could pass from me, then let it be so. Jesus was not lamenting the path that God, his Father, had called him to walk, but he understood the power of the potter, his Father in his life, and it was more of the pain and suffering that he was going to face. But Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. There was a surrender. God, you're my Father. Whatever you're asking, I'm submitting. I'm willing to lay down my life. To the person who fails to understand the potter's ultimate authority over us, the clay, and, and his unwavering purpose that we become more like him, that we bring honor and glory to him in all things, we will find ourselves whining and questioning every difficulty, every painful circumstances that comes in our life. When it's become lopsided, and my screen just went haywire. Hold on just a second. Wow, that is scary. Oh, my. Yes, he is. <laughs> Why? When we become lopsided, more passionate about the luxuries of this earthly life, we will become more complaining about the things that the potter is bringing and are allowing to come into our life that it might shape us and mold us to more in his image. Because the majority of people fall into the second category, I'm afraid, and I can find myself teetering there at times as well. We've begun preaching and teaching that it's okay to question God. Oftentimes we use Job as an example. Some of the prophets and others recorded in Scripture questioning God. But to these points, uh, two points, I, I want to, to share before we move on to, to a second point, two things. First of all, I've already mentioned there is a difference between asking God a question and questioning Him in our life. The first is done to help us to figure out, Lord, what is the point of this reverse? Lord, what is the purpose of this pain? Why, Lord, is this suffering here? What is it you want to teach me? How can I use this to bring honor and glory to you? Those are wonderful questions to ask. But the second would be more shameful and weak as we try to figure out, Lord, why would you even allow this suffering, this persecution to come into my life? I've chosen to serve you. I'm following you. Why in the world would you allow this to happen to me? It's more of a challenge to the potter rather than a surrender to him. Secondly, I want us to think of this thought that just because the Scripture gives us record of individuals questioning God does not mean that God was pleased with what was happening. Job lost everything. His family, he lost most of his friends, he lost his possessions. His body from top to bottom is covered with boils. He is in absolute pain physically and emotionally. And he, he began to do a little bit of questioning. But listen, let's, let's remember God's response. Jacob, where were you when I created? Jacob, where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did that? Where were you? You know where you were? You were still dust. I am God. I am almighty. I am sovereign. Friends, we just need to be careful that understand this morning, and I hope that it's coming across this way, that God is the potter. He has sovereignty over all things. And when he is working in our life, we need to submit to him because he knows what he is doing. Let's notice the pot the clay very quickly. As I've mentioned many times, God created man in his own image straight from Scripture. We understand this holy, pure, and innocent so beautifully. In ourselves, let us be reminded as clay, we are nothing. Literally, we are nothing. We do not have the power to do anything. We're nothing. The very air we breathe 
God has given to us. It's the Lord's. Our ability to breathe his air is given to us by God, the master potter himself. Any ability that we have, listen, it's not because you were created smarter than me necessarily except for the fact that God has given you the abilities that you have, me the abilities that I have, and friends, everything we have, God has given to us. We develop them, we, we study, we do what we have to do, but any place that we come to in our life in what we have, our abilities, our talents, whatever it may be, we must understand as clay we are nothing, but it has been given to us by God himself. Any success that we find, riches we gain, recognition we might enjoy is not because we are somebody or we are something. We are merely dust, lifeless and incapable of anything. We have what we have and enjoy what we enjoy only because God the potter has brought whatever it is to life in us. In Jeremiah 18, we are reminded that the potter can raise up a nation and also can bring it low. Friends, nations don't rise and fall on their own. Those are under the tutelage of the potter himself. In Isaiah 45, we read that God chose Cyrus to be king. And as you read that chapter, we're reminded that God, the potter, can arrange things for the good of those whom he loves. And God arranged circumstances to place Cyrus in the position that he could release his people. The clay can question his thoughts, his plans all day long. But in the end, friends, we're simply the pot, the vessel, the clay. He is the potter, and he chooses to use whom he will. While we have the choice to do what we want to do, whether it's to submit to the work of God in our lives or rebel against it, Let us never forget this. The potter is still in control. Listen, if we choose to rebel against the hand of the potter in our life, he will use our rebellion and our wickedness to still somehow bring about good. Do you understand that? Just because you choose to go live a life of sin and rebellion yourself, don't think that you're your own master and your God is still the potter no matter what. We read about this in Exodus 7 and it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. To understand this story, we must know that, that God is not evil. There's no evil in him, nor does he ever promote evil. He doesn't do that. Any evil in this world is because of sin and fallen man. But we must also realize that God is always, always has been, always will be more powerful than all of the evil put together. And he will never allow evil to override his plans. Never. Think about just the season we've come through. Hell rejoiced at the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was hanging on a cross, beaten, bruised, and badly marred. His blood was flowing from him, and he finally gave up the ghost and was put into a tomb. And there he was laying, literally dead. Hell rejoiced. Evil had won. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, the evil that thought they won on the third day, Jesus Christ came out of that tomb to remind everyone. Everybody, he, the potter, has all power over all evil. Hell's greatest attempt that day was overcome through a resurrection, resurrected Lord. He, the potter, has power over all things, even evil. And he can, if he so chooses, use evil to bring about good things. You think of Joseph's life. Man, what a mess it was. Evil brothers filled with envy and jealousy were going to kill him because, you know, hey, daddy loves you more than me. Was going to kill him. They, they felt bad about that. At least one did and convinced him not to do that. Let's sell him into slavery. And his own flesh and blood, his own brothers sold him into slavery that led to a life of all sorts of up and down good days and a lot of bad days, prisons and, and beatings and accusations. I mean, Joseph had a rough 
rough, rough life. But does that mean the potter didn't have his hand in his life? No, the potter was still in control. And then it came to the time when the famine was there. Joseph was in the place when his own family would have died and perished. But Joseph said, listen, what everyone else meant for evil, listen, God meant for good. He took all of the evil and turned it about for a good thing. Ladies and gentlemen, we just need to understand he's the potter. He has power over everything. We're the clay. And if you choose to rebel and live a life of sin, just understand God's still, God's still over you. We are always, always under God. We're the clay. We need to first understand, listen, this story about Pharaoh. God hardened his heart. Let's get back to that. Pharaoh was not an innocent or godly man. Let's get that straight. He was not. He was a brutal dictator overseeing the terrible abuse and oppression of the Israelites who likely numbered over a one and a half million people at the time. Wow. He was not going to submit to God's leadership, so God allowed his heart to become hardened. This was, let's understand this, this was Pharaoh's choosing. He chose not to listen to the leadership of God. And so God allowed him just to walk his path. A reminder, ladies and gentlemen, God is faithful, but he's, he's a gentleman. He's not going to force you and me to follow him. If we follow him, it's going to be because through his faithfulness, we've come to a place and an understanding that we need him desperately and we're nothing without him. And so Pharaoh's heart becomes hardened. God would not allow Pharaoh's evil to trump over his power and authority. So through Pharaoh's hard heart, God allows ten plagues to come. Five come and go, and it's getting worse and worse. Each plague worse than the previous one. And let's read Exodus 9, uh, 9 verse 7. Pharaoh refused to let people go. It said, Pharaoh remained stubborn and did not let his people go when he was told to do so. He wasn't going to submit to the potter's hand. The things continued to process from bad to worse. God allowed this for a purpose and, and that it might bring God's full glory into view. Let's read Exodus 11, verse 1, and then 7 through 10. Then the Lord told Moses, I have one more disaster to bring against Pharaoh and Egypt. And after this, listen, after this, he's going to ask you to leave Egypt. In fact, he's going to force you to leave. But none of the Israelites or their animals will be hurt. Not even a dog will bark at them. Then you will know that the Lord has treated Israel differently from Egypt. All these officials of yours will come down. They're going to bow to me. They will say, leave and take your people with you. Only then will I leave. Then in anger, Moses left the meeting with Pharaoh. That is why Moses and Aaron did all of these great miracles in front of Pharaoh. And that is why the Lord made Pharaoh so stubborn that he would not let the Israelites leave his country. Why? Because through his evil and through his wickedness, God was going to do something great. Then the Lord told Moses, the reason Pharaoh did not listen to you is that I could show my great power in Egypt. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in an evil day, a wicked day, but let's not sit in a corner cowering and thinking that it's going to be taking the upper hand. Listen, God's still on the throne. He knows what he's doing. And one of these days, friends, it's going to be the greatest experience of, of seeing God's power power and greatness over all of the wickedness of this world ladies and gentlemen god is still the potter he's still sovereign we're the clay simply put god allowed his his heart to become hardened because pharaoh chose to rebel and live his way but he was not going to let that rebellion to override he used it to bring about the glory that he deserved and then finally Let's look at the process. Because if we're going to understand the process, we really need to understand God is the potter, sovereign, authority over all. We are the clay. We're nothing. But let us remember as we go into this process, God has one purpose and one design and desire, and that is, is that we become a vessel of honor, that we can be used for his kingdom. Here's the clay. Here's where God wants us to be. And in between here, friends, there's a process that takes place. That if we'll submit to him, he can get us to a place 
friends, that is one of the most beautiful places to be in, a life that is surrendered to the will of God, a life that is surrendered to the hand of the potter in our life, and enjoying, enjoying being a vessel of honor used for him. We have tried to clearly define the vast difference between the potter and the pot. God wants to form us and shape us in the vessels that he can bring honor and glory to him. He desires that we be used willingly, but if we choose to rebel, as I mentioned, he's going to allow our hearts to be hardened, walk away from his plan, but rest assured we're not our own, and God will still use us. He has full control. He is the potter. But through this concept, the potter and the pot, we see the beautiful beautiful faithfulness of God. There is nothing that God wants more for us than for us, the clay, to be submissive to his working and molding in our lives. If you've ever worked with clay or used a potter's will or seen it take place, you understand that, that the piece of pottery that you're trying to make is, is never completed on the first try. They don't just put the clay on there and then just spin that wheel a few times and voila, there is the mug, there is the vase, there is the plate. No, they put that on there and they begin to work it. They begin to shape it and, and they begin to put it back down and start again and they got to work this out and they got to work that. What is it? It is a process to get it from a lump of clay to the piece of pottery that sits on the shelf to bring in a good dollar. Through the potter's patience, hard, stubborn pieces of clay can become beautiful vessels for good use. Again, this process of, has a positive outcome, but that positive outcome rests on the truth that we can trust God the potter, and we can submit to his will knowing that is always for our good and his glory. This process is painful at times. Our life rests in God's hand. And like a skilled potter, God knows how to apply the precise pressure. He knows when to relax his grip. He knows when to score our life with his fingernail to make that indentation. He knows when to squeeze, when to nudge. All of these to increase our ability to become the vessel that God wants us to be. We're probably all aware that this process is not always easy and really it's most times not even ever pleasant. But it is bearable. Do you get that? It is bearable when we realize it is all done with a divine purpose of the loving potter, God himself. There are times when the potter says it's time to place us in the kiln where the fires of life turn us into a stronger vessel. We must be cautious, and I would say this to us, Lord, would you help us to be cautious that we do not complain and curse every trial that comes our way. May we be reminded that sometimes these are nothing more than the flames and the fire that God is wanting to put us through, circumstances. It's all part of the process that we become stronger vessels. Clay, the primary material pottery, consists, as we've mentioned before, fine grain particles. They're weak and they're porous. But to create this strong, cohesive mass, clay goes under a firing process where the clay particles fused together under the extreme heat, transforming the clay into what is known as ceramic kilns, provide, listen to this, a controlled environment that is required for this transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here just to remind us that no matter what it is that you're facing or going through, it is always in a controlled environment. God knows, as we heard the song sing, sung this morning, he knows how much we can take. He knows uh, our, our boundaries, our limits. God knows he's not going to do something to destroy us and kill us and damage us. God is always working in our life in a controlled environment. We might think we can't stand another day. We might think we can't stand another bounce of pressure. But listen, God knows what we don't know. In that controlled environment, 
He strengthens us to be a stronger vessel for Him. We will only become strong vessels within the firing process. If we ever run from the fire, if we always run from the fire, we're always going to be weak and and brittle for kingdom work. May God help us to submit to the hand of the potter and realize that sometimes the kiln, the fire is just part of the process to get us into the vessel he wants us to be. In her book, Why?, Anne Graham Lotz described a phone call that launched her into what she says, the wild blue yonder of faith. The call was from her son, Jonathan, not that call, but this call, was from her son, Jonathan, who said, Mom, the doctor thinks that I have cancer. Anne instinctively prayed with Jonathan over the phone, and she later wrote this, I was able to praise God for his divine purpose in Jonathan's life which apparently, listen, this is, this is rich, apparently included cancer. Although we had been caught so by surprise, I know God had known about it before Jonathan was born. Therefore, I had absolute confidence that this suffering would be for Jonathan's good and God's glory. We knew God had a plan, and apparently cancer was part of God permitted this trial in Jonathan's life as a tool in the skillful hands of the master potter to mature, develop, and conform him into a greater image of Christ and to bring more honor and glory to his name. I understand disease in our world was not created by God. I understand it's because of the fall. But friends, it is through the fallen world in which we live and the trials that we face and go through that God says, listen, I'm trying to shape you and help you and form you it's hard to understand those things when you're in the middle of the trial in the middle of the fire but I'm here just to encourage someone this morning if you're in that place this morning don't forget God's the potter in his hand is still in and on your life this morning I might be talking to someone who needs to be reminded of this process Maybe it's the fire. Maybe it's the trial. For you, it may not be cancer, but it might be some other ongoing disease or debilitating thing that complicates your life terribly. For a young wife, it might be the inability to have children that brings great pain into your life. Not the children, but the inability to to have a child. For another, it might be the disability, singleness, an unexpected loss of a loved one. It could be many different things. It could be that your career has come crashing down, dreams shattered at your feet. But it's even in these things when we begin to be thinking that God is the potter, we're nothing more than the clay, that we can sing with the hymn writer, though the way seems straight and narrow, all I claimed was swept away. My ambitions, plans, and wishes wishes at my feet in ashes lay but yet in the middle of all that yet I will praise him I will praise him praise the lamb for sinners slain give him glory all ye people for his blood can wash away each stain friends what he does in us is greater than all of our dreams ambitions and wishes put together the process is not always easy or pleasant but the result and what God wants And what we need can and indeed will be beautiful. Our musicians are coming. One of the final thoughts that I want to share is this beautiful thought. Is that the master potter can take stubborn, uncooperative clay and he can make it into something else. He's the potter, we're the clay. And if you're following Christ, This process of getting us to where he wants us to be is not always pleasant and easy and exciting, but if we'll submit to him, friends, it's doable. It's beautiful in the end result. But in our text, in Jeremiah 18, in verse 3, verse 4, excuse me, we read these words. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hands, and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. 
the potter having power over the clay, passionate about bringing good and glory to himself. I'm convinced that this morning I might be talking to someone, whether it be here or online. Maybe you will listen to this later and it, it will strike a chord with you, but your life is not going the way that it should. You've made some bad decisions somewhere along life's path. Your marriage didn't work out, and today your, your home is broken, and you just feel like you're a vessel broken and shattered. You must be cast aside because surely there's nothing that could come good of your brokenness. Perhaps a rebellious heart has led you down a long road, failure again and again, and emptiness. But may I remind you today that the potter, wants to take all of those broken pieces and make them into something valuable, a vessel that he can still use. Maybe God is speaking to someone this morning who needs to surrender an area, something in their life. God has been working on in your life. He's been firmly pushing here and making this area of your life uncomfortable. And, and you just maybe down deep this morning, you're thinking, the best thing I can do is just surrender. I'm the clay. Just surrender to his hand. Let me just remind you that that's the faithfulness of God working in you patiently, pointing out something in your life that needs looked at. And if you will just submit to his hand, it's the most beautiful thing that can be done. It could be failure in your life that has you discouraged again. You're almost to a point where you wonder, is there any hope for me in my life? I do so well, and then I just fall apart. Failure is just seemingly part of my constant DNA. Is there any hope? If that is you this morning, let me quickly tell you to push the pause button and assure you that in Christ there is always hope. As long as we're this side of God's grace, folks, there is always hope. We're standing together this morning, and we're going to have Glenn just sing one verse. If you would like to join in and sing with them, you can. But maybe someone here, I'd just like to invite anyone here, if you just feel the need that that maybe the Holy Spirit has been working in your life, the potter's hand has been working in your life, an area, failure, whatever it may be, That's between you and God, and you would just like to come this morning and kneel in an altar, a front seat, and say, Lord, you're the potter, and I am the clay, and I just want you to know this morning, Lord, whatever the difficulty, whatever the situation, whatever it is, Lord, I might not understand it, but I don't want to question you. Lord, I just want to submit to you. Your will be done in my life. If you would like to come, we're going to close in prayer, but let's sing as Glenn would sing this familiar song. Let's pray it. Let's sing it. And if you would like to come forward, you're invited to do so now. It takes to draw closer to you, Lord. That's what I'll be willing to do. For whatever it takes to be more like you that's what I'll be willing to do I'll trade sunshine for rain comfort for pain that's what I'll be For whatever it takes for my will to break, that's what I'll be willing to do. Whatever it takes One is come, to we're gonna draw have a time of closer. Why don't you just come this morning and give it to the Lord? Say, Lord, That's here it is. I submit it to you. To you are the potter. 
you're the potter. I am the clay. For whatever it takes. A couple others have come. Anyone else want to, to step be out? more like you. That's what I'll be willing. It doesn't have to be an admission of I'm a sinner. It's just Lord. You're the potter, and I want to give it to you. I'll trade sunshine for I want to be what you want me to be. Comfort for pain. That's what I'll be willing to Anyone else this morning? Several have come. For whatever it takes. For my. That's what I'll be with. I'll trade sunshine and rain. Let's sing that part again. At the end of this, we'll close. I'll trade sunshine for rain. Anyone else? Comfort. Thank God for the potter. For pain. Shaping That's us. what I'll be. Whatever it takes for Jesus. my will to break, that's what I'll be willing. Amen. Several have come. Those who know how to pray, there's some ladies and gentlemen scattered throughout here. Gather in and let's have a time of prayer. Let's pray with them as they just pour out their heart to the Lord. If you have to leave, please do so quietly. But if you're willing and able to stay even where you are and just have some time of prayer in your seat, let's do so together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you are the potter and we are the clay. And Lord, we're so glad to, to be reminded of your word this morning that you have a purpose for every single one of us. Lord, you have but one desire and one design, and that is that we be a vessel of honor, be able to be set aside and used for you. Lord, you want us to be light and you want us to be salt. You want us to be an example of Christ and you want us to mirror the love and the, the characteristics and the attitude, the heart of God. And, and so, Lord, we understand that, that that takes a process along the way. We thank you for salvation, which is, a, which is a definite work in our life. We thank you for heart purity for that work in our life. But, Lord, we're so glad that you are a faithful, patient, loving, kind, gracious, heavenly Father, a potter, Dear Lord, who works with us again and again and again and again. Dear Lord, that we will be what you would have us to be. Help us, oh God, to be just submissive clay. Dear Lord, may we not resist your handiwork in our life. May we not resist the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit in our life. May we not, even in the little things, dear Lord, as a Christian, and dear Lord, as we're walking with you, dear God, as you would speak to us, may we not push it aside. May we not walk away from it. But Lord, as clay, may we just submit to your hand. And dear Lord, watch you to continually work in our life and develop us and help us to be what you would have us to be. We love you this morning. We think of these that are here that have come forward to pray. You know their hearts. You know their needs, dear God. We ask that as they just pour out their heart to you, dear Lord, as they submit to you whatever it is that's on their heart or mind, maybe it's a circumstance, dear Lord, maybe it's an issue, dear Lord, maybe it's a sin, maybe it's a lot of things, dear Lord. It, it makes no difference if we'll just have a heart willing to submit to you. Lord, you will do the work that needs to be done in our life. We love you this morning. We're so grateful that you love us and you care for us. Even the worst of sinners, dear Lord, you can reshape and remake. Dear Lord, we're not having to sit on a, a discard pile somewhere, hopeless going, hopelessly going through life. But Lord, you can make us new creatures in Christ Jesus, from dead to living, from darkness to light. And you can use us, every single one, if we'll submit to you. Lord, do your work in our life. Continue to do so, we pray. We love you. We thank you. We glorify you for what you're doing. Lord, meet these needs, we pray this morning. May they leave, dear Lord, this place of prayer, knowing that you, God, have heard them and met their need. We praise you for your help. We praise you, dear Lord.
We love you today. Praise his name. Praise his name.